So great to be with you all again in Pit 502, co-designing the future. My name is Katina Michael. I'm at this magnificent place again called Surf Beach. I'm just going to do a bit of a 360 round view only because this co-designing thing in the future means I hope that this beach and all the beaches in the world will remain clean, sustainable and for the enjoyment of all humankind. It's just something to be out in nature. And today I felt like breaking my rule and recording the formal part of my lecture from the beach. Okay, so here we are in the new Masters of Science in Public Interest Tech and we're in week four of the core course in PIT 502. So I'm going to do what I do every week and that's reinstate why you're doing 502. The first thing is to demonstrate an ability to work in a team. And that team could be virtual, it could be your peers within uh, the classroom setting, online and remotely, or it might well be someone that you're working with at ASU or beyond who actually understands your public interest technology challenge. I would say that team also forms and incorporates the people you interviewed in week three and two. And some of you are here continuing your interviews, which is music to my ears. All right. The second thing we look at is to develop or engage in a public interest technology project using a co-design methodology. And as I said to you all, look, we're all going through this co-design thing together. We don't know if it's the most appropriate methodology to use, but we're having a go with it. And we'll learn the pros and cons of co-design because we're living it in our project. Then it's to design across one or more verticals, and a lot of you have chosen various kinds of uh, voting applications, for example, others uh, applications to do with uh, gender violence, and even uh, caring for animals as patients. And to elicit and analyze end users' needs to innovate responsibly. And really this end user engagement, this participation by end users is what I stress throughout the whole course. We're in week four of seven and a half weeks. And next week's gonna be even more fun than this week, but design is pretty cool itself. It's so open to so many different techniques and approaches. And there are levels in the design process of thinking. And that's what I'll be talking to you about today. Some of you might feel I'm skimming through a lot of material, but that's because you'll have readings to support your learning this week. For this module, our learning outcomes are as follows. I want you to understand users and stakeholders as partners in the design process. Partners. What do partners do? They hold hands together. They're there for each other. They make sure they uh, are adequately, uh, you know, um, have enough water and have enough food to eat, for example. But partners and partnerships require things to go hand in hand. All right. I'll describe a variety of by design philosophical approaches. And here I list many, and we'll go through them in a moment, quite high level at that. Apply a diverse range of design tools to a public interest technology challenge. And there's so many, I mean, IDEO to mention, excuse me, one company, uh, interactive design to mention another. And then all these government agencies that are coming out with these toolkits are pretty awesome. And that's the last objective, the toolkits for the domain specific research that you're doing. And so there are toolkits for homelessness, there are toolkits for poverty, there are toolkits for mental health. And these toolkits help people like us who examine and investigate and go along with uh, groups, community groups to engage with them uh, at a variety of levels using these toolkits. And if they don't exist, I say, just create them. Create them from your understanding and from your learning and from looking at what others in this same domain are beginning to look at themselves. So we're in this design process. How do we build on what is already strong? And that's in that's this one, this section here on this diagram is assuming that there is something there already. But in most cases in society, when we're looking at these global challenges, there is something there. People have trailblazed before us. The question is how do we improve or build something new? commensurate to what is existing. We can never forget what is there already. Okay, so let's start off with user-centered design. This is like a 101, what is design uh, for those doing sort of requirements engineering um, and more in the domain of human computer interaction. The first thing you sort of see as being groundbreaking is this thing called user-centered design. 
uh, I don't know who we, where we were designing for before, but this is user-centered design. Okay. So it's an iterative design process in which designers focus on the users and their needs in each phase of the design process. So it's not really participation. I need to stress that it's sort of user oriented or user focused or user centered. It's where design teams involve users throughout the design process via a variety of research and design techniques to create highly usable and accessible products for them. So understand the context of use, specify user requirements, design solutions, and evaluate against requirements. I mean, this is what we typically used to do in consulting companies. This is before we discovered what empathy was, of course, and discovered that actually people have values and cultures and norms and a whole bunch of other things. So without being too much more facetious, let's move on. Not that we discount user-centered design because a great number of user experience designers actually do user-centered design. Okay, good participatory you know, practices and design. What is PD? It's an approach where all stakeholders are involved in the design process, not just users. Good participatory design depends on three key areas, adhering to core principles, designing a suitable process and applying the right tools and methods. And we can see this here in this sort of three-pronged Venn diagram, that there's a role of a facilitator, which is in achieving effective participatory design. And I know a whole bunch of great facilitators at ASU, I might say. One of them is uh, Professor Mahmoud Farouk uh, from our Washington DC office. I would say he's a wonderful facilitator. So why participatory design? Well, evidence is showing us there's a reduction in the risk of failure of the large scale system or even business system. And consequently, you reduce costs. There are savings because if people are involved in a process, what they're going to do is they're going to get engaged and they're going to embrace it. They built it, so they want it. They were part of its beginnings. They gave their feedback. They felt heard. And lo and behold, everything takes root from there. Hopefully, anyway, that's the theory and what surveys are showing us. Participation can build ownership of the outcome, it can boost confidence and self-reliance. It can enable realistic expectations to form and lower resistance to change. Generally, humans don't like change unless it benefits them somehow, it doesn't cause them stress. And participation can foster stronger bonds and in turn, greater community involvement. And on this website, participateindesign.org, which I encourage all of you to visit, there's this list of 21 tools and methods for participatory design. I, I love them. I taught them in my future class, uh, Welcome to the Future, FIS 111 at ASU. And the students really enjoyed us when we uh, honed in on a couple of them. So future planning, we all enjoy looking into the future and seeing what it might be like. Community notice boards, street polls, copy sessions, community living room, orientation, design workshop, design clinic, walking conversation, open office, one-to-one -one prototyping, McCann party, mapping workshop, photo booth, that's a really fun one, ideas market, interactive exhibition, art making, crowdsourcing, DIY toolkits, interviews, which you've already done by the way, and scenario game and role plays. 11 principles for designing with people, build relationships, right? Go back to that week one, it was all about relationship building as we endeavor to do an interview. Leverage existing networks. Yes, I've not told you to shy away from those networks that you have already in your organizations and your institutes. Keep going, keep forging forward with those. Go to where the people are, yes. If the people want something, you go and ask them. You don't go to the people who are not gonna use the system. Make information accessible easily available, really at a click of a button if possible. Facilitate, not prescribe. Facilitation is an art. Prescription is usually a dominating force, being highly prescriptive. Enlist neutral facilitators, test and refine, talk less and do more. Do not present a perfect solution. See people for what they are good at and build capability over time. Here in quotations, I've got designers create more innovative concepts and ideas when working within a co-design environment with others than they do when creating ideas on their own. So participation and co-design means that you're sort of sparring off one another. You're learning from one another and ideas are being generated in a dynamic way. Good designs usually take more than two or three people. There's a lot of people 
doing what's called collective sense making around an idea or a set of ideas. So why do we need design? A lot of large scale agencies in the federal and government state levels are now beginning to talk about co-design. In fact, in Australia, you find so much literature, good literature, excellent toolkits from state governments exercising co-design within several contexts like poverty, homelessness, disability, young people, girls, are fascinating, absolutely fascinating. But there's always room to grow and to develop. The co-design researcher um, is part of future design users. They are there to empower the future users and to listen to people. What do you need? This primary question, what do you need? And how can you come on board with us so that we can help one another fulfill those needs? In this participatory design process, we see sort of these three hubs of collection, synthesis and design and build. And really that's about having an objective, having ideas, comments and voting on those ideas and saying which ones are the most important, prioritizing and having a reality check, which ones are possible, which ones should we really be striving for, this straw man concept and building and iterating, getting comments again, and then finally releasing something that is functional to the community of users. Here we are, I mentioned Professor Mahmoud Farouk earlier in Washington, DC. Here he is in his We the Internet Forum, sponsored by Mission Publix and ASU, and so many other sort of uh, participatory agencies uh, that were conducting their own We the Internet and then sharing ideas at a global level. This was done in 2018, but these are some of the participants that you see here that got involved in the process. Lots of smiling faces, they're all actually sharing, that's why. Here we have Professor Tamu Leonin with his participatory design product schema. He says, we look at contextual inquiry, go to participatory design, product design, hypothesis, and then out we go and then iterate again and again and again. So we define the context and the preliminary design challenges, define the preliminary concepts, define the use cases and basic interactions and then deliver the artifacts with some kind of functional software prototype. Put in another way, have a look at this diagram, looking at participatory design as an iterative process and these bubbles showing how much investment is made at each stage. Well, right at the beginning, as I did tell you, that was going to be the, the big curve, you know, the big sort of climb. Then we went to the design phase, which we are in at the moment. Still requires a lot of investment of time, but delivery and deployment, again, we go back up to that investment of time. That's when things are operational. Usually we reiterate and iterate and iterate to get the product or process right. I'm gonna shoot everyone over to uh, participatory design, a special issue of communications of the ACM back in 1993. Friends, go to those articles. They're critical. They were there at the beginning. And so we've got many by design approaches. I mentioned a few of them in the beginning in our uh, course, uh, week outcomes, learning outcomes, but we really went quickly through user-centered design, participatory design and co-design. In a moment, we'll touch on value-sensitive design, this and Kapukian's privacy and security by design, uh, John C. Haven's leading the IEEE effort of ethical alignment by design, where Sarah Speakerman has done a lot of work Engineering by Design, Stefan Enberg and so many others in Europe, Democracy by Design, Nancy Cook, uh, and of course, uh, sorry, Nancy Thomas, and of course, Jeremy Pitt, uh, with so many others more recently looking at Democracy by Design principles, and then even people like Shannon Vaila uh, looking at virtue ethics as they may turn, you know, come into values, may play into values. And so I love this diagram here from the Studio Lab uh, in the Netherlands. I'll encourage you all to go to this uh, website. But I like it because it shows on the four axes. You can be led by the design. User can be the subject. You could be led by research or the user is as a partner or somewhere within those you know, uh, four quadrants you sit. So you're led by design and the user is a subject or uh, you're led by design, the user is seen as a partner, 
we are led by research and the user is a part. And again, that Scandinavian influence here of code um, and more above here, the participatory side rather than the code design part. But you can see all of this is really about having users engaged. Here more, we're looking at user experience design. Uh, you know, I'm not too fussed about using these techniques because you will all use them, whatever kind of design approach we, we use, but user-centered is more about that traditional consultant's view of requirements analysis within the HCI space. Here's an example of democracy by design, 2014 beautiful diagram by Nancy Thomas, looking at active and deliberative public participation, freedom, justice, and equal opportunity, and educated and informed citizenry, effective government structures. And this is a lot of the work that uh, Vanessa Teague is starting to do in Australia in her uh, open democracy and democracy by design work. Uh, particularly with systems uh, and voting and elections and uh, democratic processes. Batya Friedman, uh, I've never met, but I think I have had exchange with her uh, over the internet in the review of a paper many years ago. Um, but David Hendry, uh, who works with Batya, sorry, just had to get up so I didn't get my, my computer wet. Batya Friedman, uh, who works with uh, David Hendry and vice versa. I have done a lot of work in this space. Value sensitive design is a theoretically grounded approach to the design of technology that accounts for human values in a principled and comprehensive way. So friends, it's not about value in terms of economic value, like money. It's about how do we look at the broader meaning of the term wherein values refers to what a person or a group of people consider important in life. And that's really different to what the tech companies consider important in life, right? That's what we have to know, that there is a difference here. And I, I love Batya Friedman's work and her group's work at the University of Washington. It is about values and value-sensitive design. Very different way to look at it. She says here, in this sense, people find many things of value, both lofty and mundane, their children, their friendships, morning tea, education, art, a walk in the woods, nice manners, good science, a wise leader, clean air. This broader framing of values has a long history, she says, since the time of Plato, for example, the content of value-oriented discourse has ranged widely emphasizing, quote, the good, the end, the right, obligation, virtual, moral judgment, aesthetic judgment, the beautiful, truth, and validity. I love that. She's citing here uh, Frankina. Sometimes ethics has been subsumed within the theory of values, and other times conversely with ethical values viewed as just one component of ethics more generally. So, here are some examples of human values. Human welfare, ownership and property, privacy, freedom from bias, universal usability, trust, autonomy, informed consent, accountability, courtesy, identity, calmness, environmental sustainability. These are all things that we look for in each other, truly. But what is relevant here to the emerging technologies today as we look at different kinds of public interest technology challenges? So I do want you to think about this. And these sources here are really the fantastic sources of sources that we should all be reading uh, at bedtime. I mean, I can point you to people like Friedman again, uh, Rottenberg here in Agre, Nissenbaum, Showman, of course. So many wonderful writers here. Schneiderman, who's published with Technology and Society Transactions. The Belmont Report, of course, which was uh, epic and made a massive uh, splash. And some other, Sherry Turkle here. It's just wonderful to see those people cited, all, all, all people that I admire. So the practical suggestions for value sensitive design, Friedman and team say, start with a value, a technology or a context of use. Identify direct and indirect stakeholders. Again, going back to that socio-technical design approach that Dr. Robert Abba so often uh, uses in her work. And of course, direct and indirect use, stakeholders and users as well. Identify benefits and harms for each stakeholder group map the benefits and harms into corresponding values, conduct a conceptual investigation of key values, identify potential value conflicts, integrate the value considerations into one's organizational structure. 
embed them. Human values with ethical import often implicated in systems design and understand the heuristics for interviewing stakeholders and the heuristics for technical investigations. All wonderful um, ideas. We then move to privacy and security by design. So at one level, you could be doing user-centered design. At another level, co-design or participatory design. And of course, there are some pros and cons to each of these and you might borrow. You can't do all three at once, um, but you may be doing a variant of each. Uh, you may be including in your democracy by design uh, something key to privacy by design and even in the value sensitive design incorporating privacy if we go back to Batia's human values there's privacy here and so what is privacy by design anchor vukian's privacy by design is honing in more specifically on that value of privacy and saying we could have by design for really each one of these values in theory anyway we could have a by design approach for each one of these and kabukian's taken that particular value and honed in on the privacy by design and said there are seven principles in privacy by design proactive not reactive privacy as the default setting privacy embedded into the design You've got full functionality none of this zero sum you have either privacy or security or you have uh, a functional system you can have all of these things happening at once end-to-end -end security full life cycle protection visibility and transparency, keeping things open and democratic, again, going back to the democracy by design, and respect for user privacy, keep it user-centric. See those words, user-centric, again, going back to the user-centered design. The first thing that I showed you on the requirements uh, engineering side, scenarios are critical in all your design processes. In fact, you're going to be doing two assessments this week, one of which will be sort of uh, embracing scenarios. What should we invest in? What should we keep? What should we change? These are the typical questions we ask. And with different scenarios, we have alternate futures, depending on which path we take. And we have this movement from the present mode of operation to the future mode of operation, this current view to a future view. And this takes scenarios, depending on where you are, the first, second or third horizon this third horizon we see a positive s curve here uh, looking with positivity at the adoption perhaps of a new technology and of course time time is so prevalent here this uh figure has come from the stratfor group an international group predominantly based out of the us which shows the eight steps to scenario planning processes a focal issue key factors external forces critical uncertainties, scenario logics, the scenarios themselves, implications and options, and early indicators. If I go to the next page, we can see that the future of transportation in Phoenix. Here we have a, a Waymo autonomous vehicle that had until recently test drivers. Of course, the majority of cases it still does, but it is starting to make non-human uh, lifts from um, Chandler to Tempe, Arizona. And this is a backdrop of some Chandler home, uh, from what I recall from Arizona. Ross Dawson has these beautiful scenario planning in action example processes. And I won't sort of sit on this, but I do encourage you to have a look at the lecture material later to really drill down to how he thinks about defining, exploring, creating, communicating, acting and building. Um, scenarios for action. Now, just really quick, because I've given you all of these toolkits online, interaction design resources, these are just like five or 10 of their like 50 or 60 different approaches in design thinking. Post-it voting, journey mapping, sharing inspiring stories, affinity diagrams, six thinking hats, which one do you have on and what kind of perspective are you supposed to be? Uh, touting while you've got that hat on looking at the problem from different views i like i wish what if this is really at the testing phase and we'll get into that when we do the lecture on test refine and implement so i won't stay here too long the empathy map i said i did i felt and i thought very different to just looking at clicks on web analytics 
Now the toolkits, and I'll just run through a few, um, are quite detailed. This one is developed by Disability Western Australia in Australia. And you can see three different um, sort of route maps that we have here to doing uh, this kind of co-design work. Here I just show two of the three, route map to improve an existing service and the route map to solve a specific issue. And you see the different steps. Um, one has credit buffing, one does not. Human-centered design, kinds of approaches and toolkits. They've divided sort of the phases into the determine the desired future state and then the problem space and the solution space. It's a bit like when I was at Nortel doing the get business and do business and we were identifying the problem and then providing a solution for the problem. IBM also used this kind of approach. And recently a discussion I had with someone said that we're moving away from this user human-centered approach to more well-being, something beyond just human-centered well-being. In this toolkit, um, it's an amazing toolkit, very moved when I opened it. There's a scenario in the middle, there's history and there's healing and acknowledging and dismantling power constructs. And the power constructs is what Rhys Farthing talked to me so intimately about the other day when I interviewed her. You'll find that on part three of this lecture series for week four, module four. And here we build humility and empathy. We define and assess topic and community needs. We ideate appropriately, we rapidly prototype, we test and learn and invite diverse coordinators, co-creators, co-producers. Best thing would be if uh, users own the design almost exclusively. Here we have some more uh, IDEO methods. If you go to designkit.org, you'll find lots and lots and lots of approaches to design uh, and choosing is probably the hardest bit you know going to mural and knowing which kinds of templates you want to use or whatever design uh, tool you're using going into uh, design kit and toolkits and out of the 200 pages choosing like the 50 most important to you i would stick with the toolkit in a domain uh, and try to follow it end to end until you become more conversant with how these things work. And then you can pick and choose which ones are the best sort of approaches. But it is an education in itself. You know, design is a whole degree in itself. But what I'm doing is exposing you to different levels of design approaches, methods and toolkits, and hoping that they will make sense in this short uh, course. So align on your target, maybe do a photo journal, body language and maybe ask the five whys just as an example finally with so many by design approaches which one do you choose and it depends on the project and context and what you're trying to achieve from the design approaches to actual individual frameworks and design exercises to collect and crystallize data together with users to sophisticated toolkits that can take you through an end-to-end -end project right you're, you can do any of these you can do a small part you know you can do an empathy map and then that's it, or you can go further. And that part is very, very time consuming in determining what you do at what stage with whom and how that information will be used. There has to be a purpose to actually drilling down on the design. You don't just uh, engage users without clear aims and research objectives. So what's required for the designer and the facilitator and when do they wear different hats perhaps? How many people do you need for the project in doing the design work? And what respect is imbued on the lived experience of the end user? How can we empower that end user and how many by design layers are applicable in any given project? It may well be just one. So with that, a short overview of week four. Good luck with your design assessments and I look forward to reading the outcomes. Thank you.